Hey, everybody. So welcome to our next part of OCHEM, which is going to be on organic chemistry spectroscopy. Today, we will be covering mass spectrometry, um, UV vis spectroscopy, um, infrared spectroscopy, and HNMR. So we'll kick things off with mass spec. Mass spec is going to be one of the lesser tested techniques in spectroscopy for the MCAT. Um, so we will just need a very basic understanding of mass spec. So mass spectrometry is a technique that is useful for determining masses, of course, and compounds, or, or rather uh, groups of compounds. Uh, the way mass spectrometry will work, um, at least the typical mass spectrometry, will work by firing electrons at a molecule, breaking covalent bonds, and then fragments will be separated by mass, as well as charge. I have charge in parentheses here because um, AMC is gonna mostly use mass spec to differentiate different masses of compounds or of groups within a compound. Um, they're not gonna do charge too heavily, um, but we do have this mass to charge ratio. And when we look at a mass spec, and then sorry, and then I record it as peaks. When we look at a mass spec uh, printout on our y axis will be relative absorbance or abundance, and our x-axis will be m to z ratio. Um, so z is going to represent charge. So higher mass of the fragment will go, will increase the mass to charge ratio. It'll show up towards the right. And then a higher charge We'll do the opposite. So for instance, if we had two fragments that had the same mass, one of them had a plus one charge, the other had a plus two charge, then the one with the plus two charge would be to the left, even though they have the same mass, because the m to z ratio would be divided by the charge. Any questions on mass spectrometry so far? All right, so let's go through one example. So let's take, for instance, two methyl butane. So we have a butane, four carbons, with a methyl on two. So there are a few different ways we could break this apart. If we broke the covalent bond here, we would fragment the molecule into a methyl and then one, two, three, four carbons 
And so the other fragment would be a C4 H9. Sorry, 11. 2n plus 2 minus 1. 2n, 8 plus 2, 10 of H9 was right. Yeah. C4 H9. Because overall, our compound should be, it's an alkane. So we should have CN H2N plus two. So what would be the mass of the methyl fragment in atomic mass units or in grams per mole? Think about a carbon and what its mass is. We have three hydrogens and what their masses are. So carbon, of course, is going to be 12. Hydrogen is one, so a total of 15. And so we would get a peak, at least theoretically, at 15. Are there other ways to get a methyl by breaking other bonds in this molecule? We could also break this bond and get a methyl up here. We could break this bond and get a methyl. Um, the MCAT's not really going to worry about relative absorbance. But if a certain functional group has like more ways that, such as this methyl, then one that you could fire electrons and break bonds, then theoretically you should have a higher absorbance. But again, I don't, I don't see the MCAT really worrying about this relative absorbance. They're going to focus more on the MZ ratio, specifically mostly the M. And then we would have 4 times 12 plus 9, which should be 48 plus 9, which is going to be 57. We should also get a peak at 57. That's one way to break this compound. Any questions on how we determine these? All right, next. What if we fragmented the molecule by firing an, uh, an electron this way? We'd get an ethyl group, C2H5. And we would get an isopropyl group, C3H7. So for our ethyl group, 2 times 12 plus 5, 24 plus 5, 29. And so we would have a peak at 29. And then we'd have a C3H7. So 3 times 12 plus 7, 36 plus 7, be 43. And so we would see another peak at 43. Okay, any questions on finding those two peaks in our mass spec? And then there's only one other way to get a peak for this molecule, which is called the molecular fragment. So the molecular fragment itself, meaning the, or the molecular ion, is gonna have its own peak. So we have five, times 12 for carbon, the 12 times one for hydrogen. And so we get 72. And this will be the molecular ion. The largest fragment is always going to be the molecular ion. One thing we can notice is if we think about the, I don't know if this is the correct term or anything, but like complementary fragments. The fragments that we got um, when we split one bond, 
they should add up to the overall atomic mass. So our 15 and our 57, which is the first split, does add up to 72. And our 29 plus 43, which is our second fragmentation, also does add up to 72. So we can see those corresponding peaks. Um, so we would see something like, I'm not really accounting for the, the absorbance or the abundance of these, but we should see some sort of version of this, um, uh, these peaks here. Any questions um, on this problem? So most of the time, um, mass spec on the MCAT would be um, this type of mass spec, the electron version. You may have seen other types of mass spec in like U-world passages. And I think there might be another type of mass spec in an AMC passage as well in the ChemVis section bank. So they can definitely change things up on you by doing different kinds of mass spec. For instance, there's a U-world passage out there where um, instead of firing electrons, you fire protons. And so they could always change things up slightly on you. And let's look at we found the mass spec pattern for this molecule on Google. So here's our 2-methylbutane. And notice that we don't really see much of a peak at 15, although that was one of the peaks that we calculated, right? Um, we do see a significant peak here at 57, which was the complementary, quote unquote, fragment from the 15. And what's interesting is, so here's our C4H9. What's interesting is we do have like C4H8, C4H7 as well, and 56 and 55 respectively. So what happened there? Why did we, why do we have multiple versions of this peak at 57? Looks like we lost some hydrogens as well. So we're thinking about the electrons that were fired. The majority seems to only have fragmented off sort of the, what do they call it? The, the base ion peak for this, 57. Um, but then there were some cases where an additional hydrogen actually got knocked off as well. Although those appear to be less abundant. And then we can see here's our 47, or sorry, 43. And here's our 29, which are our other two big peaks as well as our molecular ion. And here's a molecular ion minus one peak. Here's a C3H7, C3H6, C3H5. So those are relatively intense. They have relative abundance that's a little higher. So it looks like these ones are, are likely to happen where you knock off an additional hydrogen from the 43. Now on the MCAT, we're not gonna really worry about these, these other peaks where like additional hydrogens are lost. Um, typically, they're just going to show you sort of like the major peaks, the ones that we went over. Any questions here? Next, we'll talk about UV vis spectroscopy. So in UV vis spectroscopy, um, the types of molecules that we're analyzing have to be able to absorb a photon. And this is characteristic of conjugated systems. Conjugated systems. And so, the way that this is going to work is conjugated systems, do they have uh, more or less energy than not having a conjugated system? Are they higher or lower energy than not having one? Which one of these has less energy? 
the first one or a second one? So conjugate systems will lower the energy. Remember, energy is inverse to stability. Higher energy is higher reactivity. Lower energy is higher stability. The stability is inverse to both energy and reactivity. Conjugated systems, because the electrons are shared among, they resonate among the entire system, are more stable than non-conjugated systems or, or systems, the molecules that lack conjugation. So this guy will be lower in energy. Now, let's say we had these two molecules, call these A and B. Um, which one would have the lower energy, A or B? I'm hiding the B. A would, right? So A has more conjugation, lower in energy. Perfect. So um, our relationship for UV vis will be greater degree of conjugation. And, and you always will be analyzing uh, molecules that have conjugated systems using UV vis. Greater conjugation is going to be lower energy of the absorbed photon. The lower energy system absorbs the lower energy photon which means we have higher or lower frequency of the photon. Lower energy, lower frequency, perfect. Which means will wavelength be higher or lower? Wavelength will be higher. Perfect. And so this is where we bring in the color wheel. This is the relationship you have to have down to answer a question like this. This is where we bring in the color wheel. Let's say that our color wheel started at 400 nanometers here, or actually let's do, yeah, 400 nanometers here. Uh, what color would that be at 400 nanometers? Violet. And how far does the visible light range range to? It goes from 400 to what? 700, which would be what color? 700, which would be red. And so it goes Roy. Of a yellow marker. G. So let's say that our hmm, say that our first molecule was molecule A was orange. So molecule A looks orange. Which color did it absorb? How does the whole complementary thing work? So if you're emitting orange, you absorbed on the opposite side, blue. So this is where the wavelength absorbed was for molecule A. So then molecule B, is it more likely to be green or violet? Question is for B, Violet or green? 
um, absorbed. Sorry, hold on. Let's change, change it to, is molecule B more likely to appear red or yellow? So let's see, um, if molecule B, is it more conjugated or less conjugated? Molecule B is less conjugated, it's missing the double bond right here. So it's less conjugated, would it absorb a higher lower energy? Less conjugated, higher energy, right? So higher, en higher conjugation, lower energy. B is less conjugated, higher energy, higher frequency, and wavelength would be less. So then molecule B, is it going to absorb violet or green? Yes, because it's a shorter wavelength, it's going to absorb violet and appear yellow. We had lower conjugation, lower, higher energy, higher frequency, shorter wavelength absorbed. So any questions on how to use the concept of UV viz um, to analyze different molecules, differently conjugated molecules? Okay, cool. All right, so I'm good to erase. Next, we're gonna talk about IR. Yeah, that's, um. I'm glad, I'm glad that these are going somewhere that we can all watch these another time, because I know that this is a little bit of a foreign concept at first. Um, oh, somebody DM'd me. Can you uh, explain how the color wheel works? Um, yeah, so. We have Roy G. Biv. Um, one of my students likes to write it out like this. So if a molecule, I, I did it the opposite way. That's a little confusing. Hold on. Let me, let me write it the same way I did it before. Roy G. Bib. So when you absorb on one side of the color wheel, you absorb violet. You follow to the outside, to the other side, I mean, and you emit on that side. So if you were to absorb green, what color would you emit? Red. So that's how we use the color wheel. I hope that helps. All right, good for IR? Awesome. Excellent. Got it. So infrared, we're not going to go into the theory, uh, but what happens is when you shoot a photon in the infrared um, range at a molecule, different types of bonds will absorb will absorb it, and so different types of bonds will help us determine functional groups of a molecule. So IR spec is useful for 
differentiating functional groups in a molecule. So how do we find this useful in organic chemistry lab setting? Let's say I wanted to know if my product had appeared yet in my reaction. I can take my reaction mixture and I can do an IR on it. And if my product has a different functional group than my reactant did, and I can detect that functional group on IR, the IR spec shows that functional group, a peak for that functional group, that means that my product has at least started to form. Now, the other thing about IR though, is it is a binary. It'll show you a peak if there's at least one bond that corresponds to that peak. If there are no bonds that correspond to that peak, it'll show no peak. So it is a binary. You either get the peak or you don't. There's no like, there's more of this type of peak in the molecule. You get a better absorbed, nothing like that. So it's completely like a binary. So what are the important IR spec peaks to know? Guess technically I should have the. I never. I'm. I'm going to be honest with everybody. I never really understood the concept of wave number, or really why it's in inverse centimeters. But I guess it just never came up. So the first. Uh, let me draw our numbers in four thousand. 3,000, 2,000, 1,000. Also goes from high to low on one of these specs. Let's say we had a, a broad peak around 3,500. Would our broad peak around 3,500 correspond to what functional group? an OH group in alcohol. If we saw a, another broad peak with lower intensity, that was also around 3,500, what would that be? give you a hint, it's another molecule, it's another functional group that can hydrogen bond. So it'll be an amine. So our two hydrogen bonders, amines and alcohols, will be found 3,500, the hydrogen bonding is what's responsible for the broadness of the peak. Nice, oh, I just saw that in the chat, perfect. Then we have what's called, what organic chemists call the 3000 line. And so the relevance of this 3000 line, it separates two sharp peaks. On the left, we have an sp2 carbon to hydrogen bond. On the right side of the line, we have an sp3 carbon to hydrogen bond. That's the usefulness of this 3000 line. If you get a peak that's between 3000 and 3100 and it's sharp, you'd be at a pretty safe bet that you have an sp2 carbon to hydrogen. You have something from 2900 to 3000, be pretty sure in a sharp, I'm pretty sure that that is an sp3 carbon to hydrogen. Um, I know that there's like a set, there's an, there's an aldehyde hydrogen peak around here somewhere too. We're not gonna worry about that for the MCAT. Uh, you had to know more values on this um, chart for undergrad OCHEM than for the MCAT. Questions so far? Then at 2300, you get a pretty like tiny peak. Um, it's, I made it a little too broad. 
Um, and this will be for triple bonds. So 2300, 2250, I think it is. Triple bond, so carbon, triple bond, carbon. Carbon, triple bond, nitrogen. And then we have another peak at 700, which might be the most important, which is what bond? Uh, so this isn't the, you might be thinking of the alkene. This won't be the alkene. The 1700 sharp peak is a carbonyl. Um, and the real range for this carbonyl is about 1650 to 1750, depending on um, what type of carbonyl is it. Is it an aldehyde? Is it a ketone? Is it a carboxylic acid? Um, is it a amide? Is it an ester? Um, and so some people like to actually memorize all of the 1700 like range peaks for each functional group within the category, the overall or overarching category of carbonyls. I don't recommend you do that. The MCAT does not expect you to have any kind of resolution be, be, uh, other than or, or beyond 1700 is a carbonyl. Um, so just Around 1700, could be 1650, could be 1750. That's your carbonyl peak. Use other contacts to determine what type of carbonyl it is. So let's say it was an amide. You'd be expecting what other kind of peak there? Could you confirm it's an amide? Yeah, looking for the 3500. How would you differentiate between an amide and a carboxylic acid? Yes, low intensity, excellent. That's how you would, that was my next question. How would you differentiate between an amide and a carboxylic acid? You would look at the intensity and maybe you would compare it to a reference carboxylic acid. So somebody asked me, what type of questions can you expect from IR spectroscopy? And I'll go over an example with you in a moment. Um, actually, yeah, right now, I mean, but uh, so, the kinds of questions, there's kind of two main questions that you would potentially get on IR. The first would be um, if there's a given like 1700 peak in the molecule, um, which molecule would it be? And then you have one maybe that has a carbonyl. So like confirming the presence of a product, um, just, just a basic question like, do you know which functional groups correspond to the major peaks in IR? Uh, and then the other type of question you could get would be, how would the chemist know if this reaction went to completion? Um, and then maybe you're looking at a reactant and a product and you're, and you're like, okay, well, this reactant has this peak, this product has this other peak. And so either the absence of the reactant peak or the presence of the product peak would tell you but the reaction has proceeded. Um, somebody who DM'd me, do NH2 peaks appear sharper than the OH? Um, to my knowledge, no. Uh, they both, to me, I believe seem pretty broad. Um, it might look a little sharper on my diagram, but that's mainly because um, the I kind of had to cut off the OH peak to let in our other carbon to hydrogen peak. So I um, thought I had a problem written already. Let me write a problem for you really quick. Uh, so the question would be, confirm reaction is done. So which of the following would confirm the reaction is done? Uh, let's say
Okay. So the question is, which of the following um, observations in an IR spectroscopy um, graph uh, would uh, confirm that the reaction had gone to completion? We've answered choice A, disappearance of a broad 1700 centimeter peak. B, appearance of a sharp 2950 centimeter peak. C, disappearance of a sharp 3500 centimeter peak or D, appearance of a broad 3,400 centimeter peak. So let's hear our thoughts in the chat. See, I see not D, I see, I would say B. Um, so for B, appearance of a sharp 2950 centimeter peak. So what, uh, what is that referring to? What would the 2950 centimeter peak be? SP3 carbon to hydrogen. So would that be referring to this new bond between carbon and hydrogen? Would there not be a sharp 2950 centimeter peak in the original molecule? There would or there wouldn't be. So we do have methyl hydrogens here, as well as on this side, right? So Remember, um, IR is a binary. You either, um, you either have the peak or you don't have it. So our original molecule, because it has carbon to hydrogen, sp 3 carbon to hydrogen bonds already, um, we're not going to be able to tell that this new hydrogen is here because we would have had that peak already from these methyl hydrogens, and we would just still have it in the alcohol. Yeah. Does that make sense? So that, that was definitely the way I was trying to trick you by including that. <laughs> um, what about A? Is appearance of a broad 1700 centimeter peak, would that be right or wrong? Yes or no? No, because why? What's the wrong word? Incorrect word is broad. What about C, disappearance of a sharp 3,500 centimeter peak? Yes or no for C? No, um, there's nothing around 3,500 to disappear from our reactant. Also, the peaks that are around 3,500 are not even sharp. So what about D here? So is it okay that they said appearance of a broad 3,400 centimeter peak? Like, is it okay that it's not where, the, where it's like at the value we exactly memorized? And still be a, valuable, uh, a viable answer, yeah. So this is another way that they may try to trick you on the MCAT. Uh, I keep seeing that they, as in I didn't, uh, like implying I didn't write this question just now. <laughs> um, but this could be another way that you could, they could try to trick you on the MCAT is like, Oh, okay, I know everybody memorized 3,500. Let's give them 3,400. And it's still the best answer because none of these other answer choices were viable, um, but it may not be the exact value you memorized. So it's good to have that, have all the values memorized, of course, but just know that, of course, they could, they could switch it up a little bit. They could say 1,750. They could say 1,650 for a carbonyl. Um, any questions on our practice problem here? So some of you um, may have memorized additional values for IR. And like I said, you don't have to know as many values for IR as you did 
um, when you took undergrad organic chem. If you wanted to memorize like any additional peaks, uh, this actually doesn't have really any additional peaks beyond mine. Um, I guess it has the, this thing about an alkenial. No, that's the, that is the right one. We already had that. They, this is the only one on this chart that we didn't have. Um, if you wanted to memorize any additional peaks, the ones that I wouldn't, I guess, recommend as much against would be, you could memorize the 1600 for alkene, carbon to carbon bond, carbon to carbon double bond. Um, you could memorize around 1500 for aromatic. Um, but beyond that, I really wouldn't bother with any additional values. Uh, like the aldehyde one over here that I mentioned. I don't think you would have to know about the aldehyde here. You certainly will not memorize anything in the fingerprint region. Um, I wouldn't memorize nitro. Uh, I wouldn't memorize the carboxylic acid O to H as being different from the alcohol O to H. I wouldn't worry about that. Primary and secondary, wouldn't worry about it. Alkynes, carbon to hydrogen. Um, we would just memorize sp2 for alkene it's carbon to hydrogens and then sp3 carbon to hydrogens around here you can see these are the the people some people will memorize all of these uh carb, different carbonyls you don't need to but all, our purpose is the carbonyls are all 1700 any questions on ir about covers what we need to know for the mcat for ir All right, so let's move on to our last topic of the day, which will take probably longer than everything we've done so far. Um, hopefully not too long. Want to let everybody go home for Mother's Day. It'll be NMR. So HNMR is, um, I wouldn't say it's the high, most high yield, but there's definitely the most background that you would have to know about HNMR um, that they could ask you about. I would say IR is probably the most high yield technique that we've covered today so far, um, or not so far, that we will cover today. So HNMR, um, it uses, um, so it stands for nuclear magnetic resonance. So MRIs use this technology. Uh, we don't call them nuclear magnetic resonance imaging because people don't like the word nuclear. Um, but of course it just has to do with the nucleus of a hydrogen. And so HNMR is the preferred way of determining structure. Third way of structure determination. It uses absorbance data uh, measured for hydrogen nucleus in an electromagnetic field. One of the most basic principles of NMR is that hydrogens in identical chemical environments, hydrogens in identical chemical environments will exhibit the same signal. And the four types of information that you can get 
from NMR. First is how many non, or let's say how many sets of equivalent hydrogens there are in the molecule. We'll talk about what this word equivalent means, but it goes back to this idea of hydrogens in identical chemical environments exhibiting the same signal. The second piece of information, how many neighboring hydrogens are there? Third, can give suggestions as to what functional groups are nearby. And lastly, how many equivalent hydrogens in a set? So if we put all of this data together, what we can get is a um, atomistic structural determination. We can figure out exactly what is the molecular structure of our compound. So we'll go into a little bit of detail on how NMR addresses each of these questions. Any um, questions so far? All right, so let's start off with our first question, which is, how many sets of equivalent hydrogens? In other words, how many HNMR signals are there? There's two words um, that people might get confused, which are peaks and signals. And I honestly used to use these interchangeably until I realized that's wrong. So here we have two signals. Each of these is a signal. And this signal has three peaks. This signal has one peak. Okay. So when we're talking about first question, how many sets of equivalent hydrogens are there in a molecule? We're asking really how many HNMR signals there are. And so this would have two signals, this NMR spectrum, one of the signals with three peaks. Okay. So the guidelines for guidelines for this first establish any planes of symmetry in a molecule. Second, look at individual hydrogens in their own context than at their neighbors. And then third, equivalent Hydrogens, remember, hydrogens in an identical chemical environment will be in the same signal, and that's what we will call equivalent hydrogens. Equivalent hydrogens are hydrogens bound to an identical atom across a plane of symmetry. Kind of our big big rule right there. So the question 
here for the few, these few first few practice problems will be how many HNMR signals are there in the molecule? Start with this guy. Actually, let's do, I'll do one on the right side and while I'm drawing the other structure, I'll let you answer that one. Okay, so that's our first problem. Question is how many HNMR signals will we see in the spectrum? And here's our second molecule. All right, did we get an answer for how many uh, HNMR signals would we see in this molecule here? We'll draw on our H's. Two, three. Let's see. So, Starting with the methyl, are these methyl hydrogens equivalent? Are they bound to an identical atom across a plane of symmetry? Are methyl hydrogens equivalent? Yes. Where's the symmetry? Well, methyl technically has, it's our carbon. A methyl has trilateral symmetry. Methyl hydrogens are always equivalent. And so we could call these guys, HA. Would these hydrogens be the same or different from these hydrogens? Same or diff, different for sure. Would they be the same as themselves? Yep, we can call these guys HB, HB. And then what about our aldehyde hydrogen? Is this a, another unique hydrogen? We have another unique hydrogen. So the answer for this molecule will be three. And the symmetry for these hydrogens, it's a little hard to see. We imagine that one of the hydrogens is coming out of the plane, the other hydrogen is going into the plane. And then, how do I do this? So uh, we have hydrogen on the right. If we're looking from this side, hydrogen on the left. The symmetry is through the plane of the molecule here for these two hydrogens here. And then this hydrogen has nobody else. What about our, our molecule here? Um, how many, same question, how many unique or equivalent sets of hydrogens are there? First, do we have any planes of symmetry? And if so, what direction? Mm -hmm. We do. It's kind of straight down the middle, right? We do have a plane of symmetry. Let's start with the hydrogens we can already see. Will these be the same or different? They'll be the same. All these HA, HA. And then draw on the rest of the hydrogens. What about these guys? These be the same or different? You guys also be the same. because they are corresponding, they're um, bonded down to an identical atom across the plane of symmetry. What about the hydrogen on the bottom of the top, same or different? Hmm. 
Hmm. Do we also have a plane of symmetry that goes like this? No, in that case, we don't have another plane of symmetry going across. And if the planes of symmetry thing isn't working out that well, we, we could also say, well, this hydrogen is only one carbon away from the hydroxyls. This hydrogen is two carbons away from the hydroxyls. And so we will have HC and then HD. The answer for this molecule will be four. Any questions? A brief aside, um, how many, so we don't really talk about carbon-13 NMR on the MCAT. Um, I think some resources cover carbon NMR, um, other resources don't cover it. I've never seen the AMC ask a question about carbon NMR. So you're probably pretty safe when it comes to carbon NMR. Um, but if we wanted to just think about carbon NMR for a second, carbon-13 signals. Um, somebody DM'd me, any hydrogens connected to the COH? Um, so there's no additional hydrogens here or here. This carbon has uh, one, two, three, four bonds already. This carbon has one, two, three, four bonds already. So there's, anytime you have a substituent group on a benzene ring, the carbon the substituent group is connected to won't have any additional hydrogens. You can always like just be like, oh, it already has a substituent, no hydrogens. Yeah. So how many carbon-13 signals would there be in this? And it's the same principle, um, planes of symmetry, right? We could start with this carbon. Is this carbon the same or different? Carbon's the same. What about this carbon right here? Same or different? Same as well. Seeing a pattern here. Um, we have this carbon who doesn't have any equivalent carbons. And then we have this carbon. So there's also gonna be four carbon-13 NMR signals in this molecule as well. So brief aside, don't expect anything on carbon-13 NMR. If you prove me wrong, I will give you $10. <laughs> and I'll apologize for you not getting that question right on your MCAT. Any questions? So next, let's talk about, actually this was question four on my list of questions. So integrals. Nobody freak out, we're not doing any calculus, I promise. <laughs> uh, integrals tell you how many uh, equivalent hydrogens in a peak? Sorry, signal. How many equivalent hydrogens in a signal? So for instance, let's say we had This molecule here. How many sets of unique hydrogens are there? Should just be one. So the integral is calculated by the machine. The machine translates it into a relative area under the curve. Now, in this case, we just have. Uh, one peak, or sorry, one signal. Uh, and the integral would equal four 
because we have four equivalent hydrogens in our one signal. Let's say we had the molecule H3C, CHCl, CH3. And we had these two signals. Uh, integral of one what would be the integral of this guy. So this time I didn't give you bond line. So let's try translating this into bond line and see where that gets us. So we have a methyl, a methyl, another carbon, and a hydrogen and a chlorine. Methyl connected to a carbon who also has a hydrogen and a chlorine. And here's our other methyl. So it looks like our, our, um, our NMR spectrum has two signals. And if we, and so how many, I mean, we can tell from our structure, we have a hydrogen here, which is probably our integral of one. So then how many hydrogens would correspond to the second signal? One thing about our integrals is they always have to add up to the total number of hydrogens in the molecule, which in this case is seven. Yes, six, exactly. Yep. So then, so are these two methyls equivalent? Is there a plane of symmetry in the molecule? Is there a plane of symmetry right down the middle? It kind of looks like it isn't, but don't be tricked. The hydrogen's not pointing to the left. The chlorine is not pointing to the right. One of them is in front and one of them is in the back. It's just impossible to draw that <laughs> without using dashes and wedges. So there actually is gonna be a plane of symmetry down the middle where our two methyl groups will be one set. They'll be equivalent. So our second integral would be six. Any questions on that one? All right. So the next topic to cover is going to be splitting patterns. This is where we get our doublets and our singlets and our triplets. So the next question we'll try to answer is how many neighbors a hydrogen has. And how do we define a neighbor? A neighbor hydrogen is connected to a carbon adjacent to the hydrogen in question. Oh. Uh, a neighbor hydrogen is a hydrogen connected to a carbon adjacent to the carbon of the hydrogen in question. So 
So for instance, we took a molecule of chloroethane. First, how many signals would we have in our chloroethane? How many signals do we have? Two. We have two signals. So we have our ha, 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 and our HB, HB. So HA has how many neighbors? And HB has how many neighbors? Is the question. So how many neighbors does HA have? Has two neighbors. So all of our HAs are next door to these two HBs. So HA has two neighbors, which are HBs. How many neighbors does HB have? Three. HB will have three neighbors, the three HAs. So that's how neighbors work. Neighboring hydrogens are hydrogens connected to a carbon adjacent to the carbon of the hydrogen in question. Now, what if we had two, two dimethyl propane? So how many neighbors does the hydrogen in this molecule have? And all these hydrogens will be equivalent, right? How many neighbors here? Now we'll get to how this looks on the spectrum. Just gotta cover a couple things. How many neighbors do these guys have? So we have, we look at these hydrogens, for instance, here's their carbon of the hydrogen in question. Here's the adjacent carbon. Does this carbon have any hydrogens? Zero. So the, all of these hydrogens have zero neighbors. Uh, so what do we do about that? Is this just not gonna show up on the spectrum? Here's where the N plus one rule comes in. The N plus one rule. And so what the N plus one rule says is the number of peaks, finally we're actually talking about peaks, I just keep accidentally saying it, how many peaks in a signal will equal N plus one, where N is the number of neighbors. So if we had, for instance, the table out, number of neighbors, and what we're gonna call splitting pattern. So if we start from having zero neighbors. Remember, n is our number of neighbors. So we add one, we get one. And what do we call the pattern of having one peak in a signal? A singlet. So for our dude right here, we would have a singlet where the integral equals 12 hydrogens. So it's really fortunate that this n plus one rule exists because if it was just the n rule, 
then if you had no neighbors, you would have no peaks in your signal. And then how do you even have a signal at that point? So that's um, it's kind of fortunate about this n plus one rule. And let's cover all the rest of them. One neighbors is called a doublet. Two neighbors is a triplet. Three neighbors is a The question is like, oh, is it a tetrit, like tetra, or is it a quadruplet, like babies? It's a, it's a barbershop. A quartet. Yeah. Four neighbors would be a. Then the question is like, is it pentagon or is it like quintet? It's a pentet. And then once you get to five neighbors, n plus one would be six. So you could see a sextet. However, on lower resolution machines, it gets a little hard to tell the difference between six and seven and eight peaks in a signal. So you may just, it may just register as a multiplet. So for our purposes, multiplet is when you get to about five to six peaks in a signal, at that point, we just start calling it a multiplet and we say, okay, that has a lot of neighbors. Right. Any questions so far? And then one thing to note is in our definition, we said neighboring hydrogens are connected to a carbon adjacent to the carbon of the hydrogen in question. And notice we only accounted for carbons. There's no splitting across heteroatoms. Heteroatoms are anything that's not a carbon or a hydrogen, nitrogen, oxygen, anything that's not a carbon or a hydrogen. So for instance, in methanol, we would have two signals. We'd have a three hydrogen signal for the methyl. As soon as you see a heteroatom mentally or even literally cross it out, because we don't count this as a neighbor because we can't split across heteroatoms. And we would also have a one hydrogen singlet for the OH hydrogen itself. Any questions on splitting before we head over to the last uh, thing, which is the chemical environment. So this is where we'll talk about chemical shift. Okay. So lastly, chemical shift. Answers the question. What functional groups are nearby? What functional groups are nearby? And in terms of terminology, this is our shift, the unit, for some reason I've never been able to figure out is parts per million. The figures, the, the readouts for NMR are from high to low.
And then we have two terms which are referring to sort of changes in shift or relative shift, which is downfield is to the left, upfield is to the right. And downfield is the result of D shielding. And upfield is the result of shield. Um, one way to remember that downfield is D shielding is double D. And then upfield is shielding um, United States, US, I don't know. I just remember the two Ds go together and then you have US on the other side. All right, so let's talk about some factors that affect shift. So remember, when we talk about shielding, we're talking about is the influence of core electrons on typically valence electrons. But in this case, we're going to be referring to, of course, the nucleus. So the more electron density around a nucleus, the more shielded it is. More electron density around a nucleus is more shielded. And therefore, less electron density around a nucleus will be D shielded. So in terms of factors affecting shift, the first one will be electronegativity. So the, the shift value for a basic alkyl group, a methyl, ethyl, just a carbon that has nothing going on but carbons and hydrogens is around one. So for instance, if we look at some methyl derivatives, we have a group Y. So if we had just Y was equal to a methyl, Actually, the shift is even less than one, it's 0 0.26. Let's say that we changed methyl to a chlorine group. Chlorine is it more or less electronegative than carbon? More electronegative than carbon. So we're replacing a less electronegative group with a more electronegative group. Is that gonna to lead to more shielding or more de-shielding? D shielding, good. So if we have an electronegative group, it's gonna result in less electron density around a nucleus. And so greater electronegativity will lead to greater D shielding and then therefore greater shift. The value if we of the, of the hydrogen in question is, is these guys. Um, for when that group is a chlorine is 3.06. You see the shift did a little bit of a hop all the way up to about three. Let's say we changed our chlorine to OCH3. What would be the shift of the hydrogens in question now? Would it be higher or lower than 3.06? Should be higher than 3.06 because we know in Fonkelbrisch, O comes before the CL. So 3.25 is the value for that dude. Any questions on electronegativity? Electronegativity is going to cause a downfield shift due to de-shielding. Um, and then more substituted carbons 
will tend to have a higher shift. So like a tertiary carbon will have a greater shift than like a primary carbon uh, for the hydrogens, of course. Let's say hydrogen on tertiary carbon would have a higher shift than that of a primary carbon. Um, another factor that can affect shift is hydrogen bonding. H bonding will increase the range of values for shift. So for instance, an alcohol hydrogen and hydrogen bond. And just like IR, right, that increased. In IR, it actually literally increased like the broadness of the peak in NMR just increases the range of values. So it doesn't change the shape of the peak so much as the potential range, which unfortunately is not that helpful because <laughs> if you have like a, big, oh, it could be anywhere from two to five. It's not very helpful in determining that's an, uh, an alcohol hydrogen, right? And then another one, for instance, carboxylic acid, Hydrogen, would it be more or would it be more shielded or deshielded than an alcohol? Hmm. Uh, well, there's an additional oxygen over here, which is electronegative, right? So then we'd actually have more deshielding and carboxylic acid will be between 10 to 13 parts per million. Um, this value is more important to memorize than this value. If you wanna memorize them both, feel free. And then a couple other values to memorize. Let's see if I can squeeze them all on the same board without making anything too difficult to spot. So if we look, at, if we have a benzene ring, those hydrogens, all of them are going to be from 6.5 to eight. You do wanna memorize that for sure. So for benzene hydrogen, 6.5 to eight is our range. And then for alkene hydrogens, so hydrogens that are directly coming off an alkene, then we call them vanillic hydrogens. The value for that is six parts per million. So if you wanna take a picture right now, I'm gonna to try to block out the glare. Five, four, three, two, one. Any questions on shift? All right, so uh, we'll, we have one more practice problem left in our class today. I will just show you a figure that I found for NMR. So we have, it has a couple more values like actually Looks like it just has one more value, really. We have an aldehyde hydrogens around 10. Here's our carboxylic acid. Here's our alcohol. Um, hydrogens that are next door to electronegative atoms. Here's our higher shift. We got like three, four, even up to five. Here's our, these are vanillic, just means that you're a hydrogen directly coming off of malkene carbon around six, aromatic around 6.5 to eight. And allylic hydrogens are just hydrogens that are on a carbon next door to an alkene that's not actually part of the alkene. I don't know if you need to memorize that. I, I wouldn't really bother because it's really hard to tell the difference even from just a regular hydrogen on a carbon that's not next to an alkene. Okay, so we have one more practice problem of the day. Um, anything before I erase?
Okay, so say we have a molecule with a formula of C3H8O. And at zero, you may see a small peak that acts as a reference point called TMS. Something about, um, I think this is silicon or something like that. It's basically, it's a molecule that I think it has like, actually, I'm not gonna speak about it because I'm gonna get out of my own depth very quickly. Um, but yeah, we ignore anything that corresponds to this TMS. It's just a reference point. One, two, three, four, five. And we copy this down between zero and one. We have a triplet integral equal to three. Uh, between one and two, we have a multiplet integral equal to two. Between three and four, we have a triplet integral equal to two. Between four and five, we have a singlet integral equal to one. And your options All right, I'll give you a moment to check this guy out. One thing that can help, I'm going to jump in right now. <laughs> One thing that can help is making a list of your data. So starting here, we have a a 3H triplet with a shift of 0 0.9. Oh, somebody. In. The three H triplet with a shift is about 0 0.9. We have a two N multiplet, sorry, two H multiplet with a shift about 1.2 ish, 1.5. And then I have a one, sorry, a two hydrogen triplet with a shift of about 3.7. And we have a one hydrogen singlet of a shift of about 4.8. So those are our four sort of pieces. You might be able to narrow it down already, but I'll show you something that you could you could use if you have molecules that are too similar, or if you want just a way to organize your data. Um, so we can start, we can also include the number of neighbors. And so if you have a triplet, how many neighbors do you have? Two neighbors. Multiplet uh five or more neighbors triplet two neighbors singlet no neighbors okay 
So I'm, what would the three hydrogen that are all equivalent, what sort of functional group would that be? Three hydrogens all equivalent would be what? Yeah, methyl, right? Yeah. The methyl with two neighbors. We have two hydrogens with quite a few neighbors. So I like to draw like little puzzle pieces. Five or more neighbors. We have another 2H. And triplets to two neighbors. And two puzzle pieces because carbon needs four bonds. And then is this last hydrogen on a carbon as well, or can it even be? So another thing you could do is sort of a counting. So if I count the number of hydrogens so far in our molecule, we have three, four, five, six, seven hydrogens. So we're missing one hydrogen from our three fragments so far. We have three carbons, which was all the carbons. So we're good on carbons. We're also missing an oxygen. And so it looks like our last hydrogen has to be on an oxygen. How many bonds does oxygen make? Yes, yeah, OH, nice. Let's see that. Oxygen makes two bonds. And then we don't know how many neighbors are on any adjacent carbons because remember, hydrogens on heteroatoms cannot split. So question mark number of neighbors. So then we have four puzzle pieces now, where A, B, let's call them puzzle pieces, one, two, three, uh, whatever, little A, little B, little C, little D. So we have A, B, C, and D puzzle pieces. And um, which puzzle pieces link together? Which puzzle pieces link together? You can type your answer as like A, B, or B, C, or C, D. A and B link together. Yeah, so looking at B, we need a lot of hydrogens. We need as many hydrogens as possible. So B cannot be next to D because D would not allow it to have five neighbors. B could be next to A as well as B would also have to be next to C as well to get that, num that high number of neighbors. And then looks like we only have one more puzzle piece and looks like we have only one more place to put it. And so we can link these all together and we have A, CH3, CH2B, CH2C and OHD. And here is our answer, which is answer choice. B, perfect. So that's how we could do this systematically. How could we do this um, if we wanted to save time? So we can focus on trying to eliminate answer choices. We have, notice we have a singlet. Would answer choice A have any singlets? Has no singlets, it'd have three hydrogen neighbors to two hydrogen neighbors. And so those guys have, oh, actually just kidding. The hydrogens on this carbon would be a singlet. Okay, so that doesn't help. Um, let's see, we would have three integral two integral, three integral, three, two, okay. So A can't work, it doesn't have the right integrals, so it could be three, two, and three. Um, answer choice C, 
would the two methyls be equivalent? Two methyl group hydrogens be equivalent? Doesn't the 1H singlet at 4.8 give away that there's an OH? Definitely, I agree with you, yeah. The 1H singlet at five, like five-ish, like could literally only be an alcohol out of our answer choices. So we, I agree with you, you could get it down to A and C that way. Um, D also doesn't even have the right number of hydrogens. It has one, two, three, four, five, six. So no hydrogens here or here. It's not the right number of hydrogens. And then C would also have these two hydrogens or groups methyl hydrogens would be six for integral. And so we don't have a six integral, so we can also eliminate C. So that's how you could do this a little faster on the actual MCAT. Yeah, exactly. You can eliminate A and D. And then that way, you're, at least you're between two, the, the two alcohols. And then you could look for other patterns like integrals or neighbors. All right. So any questions on this problem or on NMR while we are still recording for YouTube? All right, everybody. I will um, be posting this sometime tonight or tomorrow. Well, if you're watching this on YouTube, it's already been posted. Um, so thank you for everybody who attended today and thank you for everybody who's watching at home. Um, I will see you in next week's video, which will be starting reactions. Uh, we'll be covering SN substitution and elimination with heavy focus on substitution. Everybody have a great rest of your weekend. Um, and for those of you watching on YouTube, um, feel, feel free to subscribe to my channel if you want more OCHEM content. Bye.